Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Lenten Talks on the prophet Isaiah, specifically the servant songs in the latter part of the book of the prophet Isaiah. I'm joined once again this evening by Father Jamie McMorrin, and we are very glad to have you with us as we continue this journey through Lent and through these very beautiful texts. I'd like to start with a prayer, um, and if you know it, please pray it along with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, we beseech thee all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always from thee, and by thee be happily ended. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Just as a reminder to everybody, you can ask questions during the webinar, and we will have a Q&A session at the very end. There should be a little icon at the bottom of your screen that you can click on in order to type in your question. And if you prefer to submit it anonymously, you can do that. You don't have to put your name on it. So without further ado, <clears throat> we'll go on with our text for the evening. So in last week's talk, we looked at Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 7. And the poem that we looked that we looked at focused on God's choice of this servant and God's constant care in upholding him, how he took care of him, how he chose him. There were some very powerful descriptions of God's identity as the creator of all things and also the connection that the one who has created all things also knows this one person, this servant, and he knows him very personally. And the language used, you'll remember, was very, uh, I would say, verb heavy. Um, and that, that gives strength. You could say it gives oomph to the message that's being, uh, that's being portrayed. And then, of course, Father Jamie tied all of that into what we see in the Gospels with the mission of Jesus. So there's this very intentional connection between the text of Isaiah and the mission and the person of Jesus. So the servant of God, his chosen one, we could say, takes flesh in Jesus, and he is chosen for the sake of the people, for the sake of this mission. So we'll see that a bit more today in the second poem. And this week's text is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to 6. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the text that we're going to be looking at today. Now, the gospel passage on Tuesday of Holy Week, which is when this text appears, this song, um, brings us to the Last Supper as narrated in St. John's gospel. And this is directly after the washing of the feet, and Jesus announces his imminent betrayal. And the apostles are, I think rather remarkably, unaware of what he's talking about, except, of course, Judas. And so... Jesus hands Judas the morsel, and he takes it and goes out, and it is night, we're told. And we also hear in this gospel, Peter's profession of fidelity and his protest, you know, master, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And then, of course, Jesus tells him that he's going to betray him. So just to give you a little bit of the liturgical context for what is going on in the gospel that day, when we hear this text from Isaiah. But so we'll focus on, on reading from Isaiah. And again, this is the second passage of the servant of the Lord. And there are several elements that reappear from the passage that we looked at last week. So we'll highlight those. And there are some new things to consider as, as well. And so we can, um, we'll, we'll look at those as well. Um, so as with any text in the Bible, the first thing we need to do is kind of get our bearings. So we see in the first few words, Islands, listen to me, pay attention, remotest peoples. So when we read that, we can and should ask ourselves, who is talking? Who is the one speaking here? So remember last week, we looked at this very beautiful poem, and we heard the voice of God speaking, of course, through the prophet Isaiah. But the prophet and the words that he speaks sort of blend together, so that even though this is called the book of the prophet Isaiah, it is God who is speaking. And last week, the servant, the chosen one, was spoken about. And this week, he was also, he was also spoken to, so God addressed him directly. But this week, the poem begins with the servant speaking. And so we have this kind of dialogue going on between God, who calls the servant, and the servant who is now responding. So Monday of Holy Week, we get the description of the servant, and God speaks to him 
Tuesday of Holy Week, the servant stands up and starts to answer. So Isaiah has kind of faded into the back. The prophet, you can't see the prophet here. You can only hear the voice of the servant. And we have something like the servant's answer to God and to the mission that God has entrusted him with. And so the servant stands up and begins to sing, islands, listen to me, pay attention, remotest peoples. Now, remember those principles of Hebrew poetry that I talked about last week. We have, if you're, if you're paying attention, we've got some parallelism happening here. So we have two commands in parallel, listen and pay attention. In other words, be attentive. So the repetition of those verbs is meant to grab you and, and say, oh gosh, I need to, I need to start like my ears should perk up. And there's an intensification there as well, because I can hear a lot of things. I can listen to a lot of things, right? But I'm not always taking in what I'm hearing. And so when he says, listen, pay attention, that means get with it, get with the program. I'm about to say something important. So islands and remotest peoples are also in peril. That means the message of salvation is going to go out to everyone, islands and remotest people, the ends of the earth. Everyone needs to hear this. So what does he want to say? The first thing he does is acknowledge the work of God. So one of the church fathers said that when we tell what God has done, when we like list the things that God has done, it's actually an act of praising and blessing him. And that's why so many of the Psalms just proclaim God's works. They just recall all of the things that God has done in history. He made the seas. He made the stars. All the creatures belong to him. And let's talk about all the creatures because they're wonderful. Just to list the things that God has done is to bless him, is to praise him. And that is exactly what the servant does to start with. But he does not just list God's generic works. He speaks about his blessings, about what God has done for him, his experience of God, we could say. He very specifically mentions what God has done for him and then how God pulls back and waits. So see what I mean here. He says, the Lord called me before I was born. From my mother's womb, he pronounced my name. He made my mouth a sharp sword and hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me into a sharpened arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Okay, so what's going on here? So this is the latter half of verse one and then all of verse two. We have three descriptions of the Lord's work, but then at the same time, we have how the Lord protects or even hides the servant until the right time. So first he calls the chosen one before he is born. He then makes his mouth sharp and he makes him an arrow even. But watch how this works. He is called before he is born, but he must first wait in the womb. So even though he is called, it's not yet time for him to work. He's a sharp sword. The Lord makes him a sharp sword, but he's tucked. He says he's tucked. He's hid in the shadow of his hand. He's tucked behind the hand of the Lord, like, like a blade that stuck up someone's sleeve, right? And, and he's a sharpened arrow, um, but he's stored in the quiver. So he's not yet released. This means that the images that we hear are in a gradual progression as the Lord prepares the servant for his mission. The images are the womb, the sharpened weapons of sword and arrow, but the servant must wait until the Lord is ready to use him. So think of it this way. After exiting the womb, the long-term preparation begins, the sharpening of sword and arrow. And it's, so to speak, you could say like the hidden interior stirrings of his being made into this instrument of God. He may not know how exactly he's being prepared, but he is. And when the time is right, the Lord is going to pull him out as a sharp sword, or he's going, to, he's going to place the arrow in his bow and then release it. And even more specifically, he says that the, servants, the servant speaks about his mouth. My mouth is a sharpened sword. So his, his speech is going to be used in some way. But there's also, again, this mystery of hiddenness, of not knowing exactly when God is going to use him. 
and, and how exactly. Now, once the servant is sufficiently prepared, once he's learned how to be hidden in God until the proper time, then he says, he, meaning God, said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I shall be glorified. Now, <clears throat> because it is the Lord God who is glorified, not the servant himself, that's important. At least the servant is not glorified yet. He may be glorified later on. We're not sure yet. But the Lord himself is going to get glory through the servant, of, through the mission of this servant. And you can tell there's a kind of triumphant ring to the words. If you look at this in light of Jesus's ministry, Remember that in John's gospel, especially the theme of God's glory is strongly present. For example, in the priestly prayer of John 17. So he says, God said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I shall be glorified. But all of a sudden in verse four, we have a very contrasting declaration from the servant himself. It's one of, you could say, discouragement and frustration. He says, God was saying this to me while I was thinking, I have toiled in vain. I have exhausted myself for nothing. Wow. Okay. What's going on there? More literally in the Hebrew, it says, for nothing have I labored. And then there's an intensification in the parallel verse for emptiness and vanity. I have used up my power. So the experience of the servant is very different from what we expect after hearing verse three, God is going to be glorified, right? If God is going to use this person to manifest his glory, why, why is he experiencing frustration? Why does it seem like what he has done hasn't reached fruition? Now, I think this is a spectacular example of the difference between the subjective and the objective realm. What I mean is, it's really interesting that it's placed on the lips of someone whom we know from last week has specifically been chosen for this universal, super important mission. And yet he feels like a failure. I've toiled in vain. So what does that mean for us? But like I said, the subjective and the objective realm, God is doing something in the life of this person. But for him, the experience of it is not that great. Even those chosen specifically by the Lord, which means, of course, every single baptized person, will experience a strange clash between what we expect from God and from our cooperation with him and what actually happens. This strange clash between what we experience and what we expect. We expect results. We want, we want to show God that you know, we're doing his will. Things are happening. It's great. We tend to think that we will know our effectiveness through the amount of success we have. And maybe that's true. But perhaps sometimes the Lord ex ex allows us to experience something like failure or frustration, which in reality isn't always a bad thing so that we can recognize and fight the discouragement that we feel. It's just a thought, and we can come back to that in the Q&A if you'd like. So the suffering servant, this, or I could say just the servant of the Lord, the chosen servant of the Lord, um, has this experience of being called by God and laboring and feeling like this isn't working. But then he changes his tone after those that first initial like words of discouragement. He changes his tone quite dramatically. He says, and all the while, my cause was with the Lord, my reward with my God. Now the Hebrew is a bit more forceful than that, to tell you the truth. He says, enough, my judgment is with the Lord. So that's what I mean when I said, he kind of like snaps himself out of his negativity and discouragement. He recognizes that the only recompense that matters is not his subjective understanding of what is success, but God's judgment of what is happening here, not his own. And so the same is true for us. 
So if you find yourself kind of going down the rabbit hole of self-pity and negativity, snap out of it. You can say it with the servant. Enough. All the while, my cause was with the Lord, my reward with my God. And then he goes on and adds, you can see a different interpretation of the same experience. I was honored in the eyes of the Lord. My God was my strength. And so he doesn't talk about the reward in the future. He's talking about the fact that God being his strength now, sustaining him in this mission, sustaining him in his work, is the reward. So it's like he's, he's sort of come around to seeing things according to the mind of the Lord. And once he does that, once he kind of snaps out of his subjective interpretation of what's going on, he kind of like gets in the groove and opens his mouth again to quote what God has said. In verse five, we have an introduction to the speech of the Lord. So like last week, we have one whole verse that is given to introduce the divine speech. But this time, it's the servant who introduces it. And we're told, again, more about the mission of the servant. So the servant says, and now the Lord has spoken, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant. Now, remember, we started this passage with the reference to the fact of he had been prepared in the womb. So anytime you're reading something in the Bible and you get a word that repeats itself, more so you, it, it appears two or three or four times in a passage. Pay attention because that's that's their way of highlighting bold underline. Pay attention to this word. Okay, so the, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant. So there's what's being emphasized there is the intricacies of of the human life that God has drawn into being, and we get this theme also in the prophet Jeremiah you would probably be familiar for, with that patch of passage from Jeremiah where he talks about before, before I existed, you knew me, you knit me together in my mother's womb. So, so that's not an uncommon theme in the Bible, but it is a strong theme, especially in the prophetic literature. And what's being emphasized there is that the person and his mission have always been known by God. And that he has prepared this from all eternity. And that is such a great thought. I mean, this all is part of this plan that God is working out. Okay. So he formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, to gather Israel to him. So remember, functioning in parallel, using the words Jacob and Israel are two ways to refer to the people of Israel. So Jacob is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. So he's the grandson of Abraham. And he is the father of the 12 tribes. He's the father of 12 sons who then become the, the, uh, the leaders of the tribes and, and, the, and the family expands from there. And so when we think about the 12 tribes, we think about their father, Jacob. So when we refer to Jacob, it's like the beginning of Israel ex Israel's expansion, you could say. And then of course, Israel when it's called that, we're referring to the nation of Israel, referring to, you could say, the monarchy, the, the, the time of the monarchy. So there's a lot that's packed in, even into just those two names. Okay, so he's going to bring Jacob back to him. He's going to gather Israel to him. Now, what is this reference about bringing him back, gathering him in? So there's a couple of things going on there. If we, if we recognize that Isaiah is prophesying about the exile, this means that those who have been driven away because of the exile are going to be called back by the servant. But of course, so that's kind of a historical meaning to that. But we can also read that at another level and say that all of us have been exiled by sin, and all of us are going to be brought back to God through the, through the work, through the mission of this servant. Now, the conversion and the return of God's people is the thrust of the mission. And Pope St. John Paul II was once asked in a plain interview if he could sum up the church in one word. And he just kind of paused and he thought about it and he said, salvation. The church is salvation. Bring the people salvation. And that's that. So the church's mission is just the extension of the mission of the servant of God. 
Um, okay, and the final verse from this passage, and then I'll let Father Jamie talk. <laughs> the final verse from this passage gives the divine speech. So the introduction in verse five, and then the servant tells us what God has said to him. And you could say it's the decision on God's part to expand the mission field, right? So God says, it is not enough for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back the survivors of Israel. So again, we have that repetition of Jacob and Israel, right? Um, it's not enough for you just to minister to the people that we know from the Old Testament. He says, I will make you the light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So we're expanding the mission field. And this is, uh, so that's the translation from the lectionary. The literal translation, and, and so this is looking at the Hebrew, it is too little for you to be a servant for me, to make stand up the tribes of Jacob, to make the watchers of Israel return. Obviously, make stand up is a very awkward way of saying this, but I, but what's going on there is there's causality. So if you say to restore the tribes of Jacob, okay, yeah, I get it. But what he actually says is, I want you to make them stand up. I want you to make them rise, okay? And it's the servant who makes the exiles stand up, rise up, and start to walk back towards the Lord. He raises them up from the ground, out of the depths, so to speak. But God wants him to, God wants to glorify him even more. Because the servant is the one speaking, we can see this as his way of saying yes to the mission. We can see it as his confirmation or perhaps an acceptance of the mission entrusted to him. So last week we saw him opening the eyes of the blind, bringing the captives out of darkness and prison. And now we see that that means he's going to make the exile stand up and begin to walk back towards the Lord. But not only that, this week the mission takes on supernatural power and is universal. Remember at the beginning, he was speaking to the islands and the people far off. And so he concludes with this statement that as God has entrusted him with this mission for Israel, he's also entrusted him with this mission for them, for these people on the islands, for these people far off. He says, I will make you the light of the nations to be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. So I'm going to hand it over to Father Jamie. We're going to hear a little bit more about how this touches us in the New Testament as well. Thanks so much, sister. You were saying that you were going to uh, l l let me speak, but I was quite hoping that you would continue to speaking. I was enjoying that so much. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you, Father. Uh, so just following on from, from what sister said and uh, covering, in fact, some of the, the same themes that have been, been mentioned, Let's go a little bit deeper into what this reading, this beautiful ancient poem, can tell us about Jesus and his life and his mission, but also what it can tell us about our own life and our own mission as his followers. I mention this in particular because this reading has a particular resonance for me. Whenever I hear it, I must admit that I think not of Tuesday in Holy Week, but of the birthday of St John the Baptist. And I think of a particular celebration of the feast of the birthday of John the Baptist, where this reading is the first reading. I remember it being read by my brother Colin in St Mary's Cathedral in the year 2016, which happened to be the day that I became a priest. I remember sitting next to my mum uh, and hearing those words, the Lord called me before I was born. Uh, from my mother's womb, he pronounced my name and feeling both tremendous gratitude to, to my parents for the gift of life uh, and to God uh, for choosing me to be his servant, to be uh, specifically to be his priest. But there's nothing very special about me. A sister mentioned what is true of, of me is true of all of us. Each, each of us is called and chosen by God uh, and chosen for, for a special mission. God knows uh, and loves each one of us, knows and loves every fibre of our being. He's lovingly counted, it's, our Lord tells us in the gospel, every hair on our heads, as we might say nowadays, every cell in our bodies. We're made by him and we're as precious to him as a newborn baby in the arms of, of his mother and father. Pope Benedict said in the mass that began his pontificate, only when we meet the living God in Christ do we know what life is. 
We are not some casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved. Each of us is necessary. It's a beautiful quote. One of my favorite things that he said. Pope Benedict obviously believed in evolution, but what he was saying was that he thought that evolution doesn't tell us everything that there is to know about our human lives. To be a human being ultimately is to be known and to be loved by another and especially loved by God himself. I think one of the reasons why that doesn't very often think in, sink in when people tell us that God loves us is because God loves everyone. So when someone tells you God loves you, I think, yeah, but he loves me as part of a great crowd of six or seven billion other people who God also loves. But that's not it. That's not really how God loves us. God knows us. God knows our name. I am terrible with names. I don't know the names of all the people in my parish or all the children in the school where I'm chaplain. I'm trying my best and I, I know quite, quite a few of them, but I certainly don't know all of them. But Jesus knows their names. Jesus is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd, unlike me, is good with names. They say that the most pleasant sound a human being can hear is the sound of our own names being spoken by someone who loves us. I wonder if tonight before you go to bed, you can get yourself quiet and still enough to hear Jesus speaking your name, just as he must have spoken the names of the first disciples, Martha and Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus and the 12 and all the others that he met. Let's try and see if we can hear him speaking to our hearts and renewing in us that personal call to be his disciples. But you might be thinking, and actually Martin Castles, good evening Martin, mentioned in the chat, I thought that last week we were saying that the servant songs were about Jesus. And here we're saying tonight that they're actually about us. Both are true. The servant who is the subject, his sister was saying the one who is doing the singing, is firstly and foremostly Jesus, to use the fancy theological language, that's the hermeneutical principle, that's the principle of interpretation that we're using in these talks. But they, they also apply to us. Why? Because we are members of Christ, joined to his body, and called each and every one of us to be sharers and participants in his mission. Not only people who dress like sister and I, so to speak, professional Christians, but, but every single Christian, from the Pope in Rome to the little baby that I baptised on Sunday afternoon. But this verse does also apply to Jesus. As we were saying last week, the incarnation of God, the beloved son of the Father, means that the incarnation began in the womb of a mother. That was where God dwelt for the first nine months of his life on earth. That was, in a sense, the first tabernacle from which he blessed the world. Specifically, it was from his mother's womb that he blessed the, the ch another child in the womb of another mother, John the Baptist, who was himself chosen for a special mission and who, even before his birth, rejoiced at the approach of Jesus, the approach of God. Jesus was also named in his mother's womb. When people are expecting a baby, sometimes they make up a list of names, boys' names, and girls' names, and so on, uh, ruling some of them out and saying, oh, perhaps we'll, we'll go for that one. Mary and St. Joseph didn't have to do that. Why? Because Jesus, even before his conception, was named by the angel Gabriel. Now, as you've probably heard, biblical names are not just ways of telling two people apart and what family they belong to. Names in the Bible tell you a person's mission, tell you what their, their life is, is, is all about. It's not unusual, therefore, when someone takes up a new mission in the church, uh, that, that they, their name changes. For example, when Sister entered the religious life, she took on a new name. And when I become Pope one day, I won't be Jamie the first, but I'll pick a new name as well. I'm only kidding. I actually don't want to be Pope. I do tell the kids in the primary school that I'm hoping that I'll be the next Pope. But uh, one of them said that they thought I would do quite a good job, which I, which I was quite happy about. But back to the subject, when Jesus takes up his mission, he's given a name which sums that mission up. Jesus, the name Jesus means God is salvation or God saves. Isn't that cool? God becomes man in order to save us, and the human name that he takes on is God is salvation. St. Paul tells us that even at the mention of Jesus's name, the angels fall down and worship. So we also should do the, our best to treat the name of God with respect, perhaps bowing our heads when we say it. But we should also call upon it. That's why God took on a name. 
and let us know what it is so that we can call on him for help. It's like God, if you can imagine, giving out his private mobile number, gives us access to him. Think about it. We're on first name terms with God. He knows our name and we know his name. It's pretty cool. Now, in the next verse, the sister was mentioning the servant, that is Jesus and those who follow him, are compared to a sharp sword and a sharp arrow, which seems at first glance in contrast to what we were saying last week about God coming in meekness and gentleness, not as a conquering hero, but as a servant who suffers. And I stand by that. But Jesus also comes to proclaim the word of God. And the word of God is compared in the New Testament, both by the author of the letter to the Hebrews and also by St. Paul to a sword. St. John's vision in the book of Revelation also saw the sword coming out of the mouth of, of, of the Lord. That image that you see on your screen is not a, a slightly gruesome martyrdom, but it's trying to convey what that might look like. The sword, as you can see, is not a little pocket knife, but is rather a powerful, sharp sword. It's a word that's strong, that has authority behind it. Jesus, the Lion of Judah, like Aslan from the Narnia stories, is not a tame lion. But like Aslan, he's good. We can think of the word of God perhaps as being like a surgeon's knife, razor sharp and dangerous in the hands of the wicked, but when applied by the physician of our souls, sometimes firmly and apparently ruthlessly, but always with precision and with care and with love, it can bring about life-saving healing. Jesus, of course, will do a lot of preaching throughout his life, but he doesn't start out his public life immediately. The first 30 years of his life apart from one or two anecdotes that we hear from St Luke, probably passed on to him by Mary from his childhood, most of those years are hidden. We call them the hidden life. He's hidden, of course, as Sister mentioned, in his mother's womb, but he's hidden also in the manger of Bethlehem and in the nowhere town of, of Nazareth. Uh, Ronald Knox uh, wrote a lovely sermon for Christmas in which he compared our relationship with God, the relationship between the human race and God, as being like a game of hide and seek. Adam and Eve begin the game by hiding in the trees of the Garden of Paradise, and we've been hiding from God in ways only slightly more creative ever since. But when God comes to earth, he in turn seems to hide from us. And Knox describes the shepherds with their well-tuned ears and the stargazing kings with their sharp eyes, searching for Jesus, searching for the King of the Jews, and saying to themselves, what, in a dark, tumble-down house, in, in an alleyway, in, in, in a city street? He would never hide in there. But of course, that's where he's found. So when he emerges, when he begins to preach, when, as it were, the sword is unsheathed and the arrow is taken out of its quiver, the people are surprised. They say to each other, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? Surely this is Joseph's boy, the carpenter's son. Yet, of those 33 years that Jesus spent on earth saving the world, 30 of them are concealed in obscurity. As a priest friend once said, Jesus spent 30 years in Nazareth and he didn't start a single youth group. Likewise for us, most of our Christian lives will be lived in obscurity. Most of our prayers and our sacrifices and our sufferings will go unacknowledged and unapplauded by the world. But that's okay. Actually, that's how it should be. Remember the warning that we were given on Ash Wednesday just a, a few weeks ago as we began Lent, not to parade our, our good deeds before the world like the hypocritical virtue signaling religious of Jesus's day, but rather to hide our good works and our sacrifices and our charity so well that we wouldn't even be able to congratulate ourselves and think what a good Christian I am. But that warning is also a promise, remember. Jesus says, God, our Heavenly Father, sees all that is done in secret, and he will reward us. I'm trying, I'm trying to learn Hebrew at the moment, uh, and I'm, I'm making a bit of a terrible job of it, truth be told. And I was telling one of my friends about this uh, the other night, and I said, I don't seem to be get, making any progress. Actually, I seem to be getting worse. And his advice was just to keep plodding away, putting in the work every day, and stop trying to measure my progress. It's good advice for learning Hebrew, for learning anything, I suppose. But it's good advice also for the spiritual life. Stop trying to measure your progress, either congratulating yourself or beating yourself up, trying to work out if you're heading for the fifth mansion or the seventh circle of hell. You're held 
the servant song tells us, in the shadow of God's hand, and he loves you. So just keep doing what you know you need to do and stop worrying. But it's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? I'm not just talking about my attempts to learn Hebrew verb paradigms, but more generally trying to live a Christian life in the 21st century in the West. When we look at the statistics of decline and predictions of further decline to come, when more personally we watch our children or our grandchildren lapse from the practice of the faith. When in a par parish you organize an event and you think it's going to be great and then hardly anybody shows up or they don't respond as, as you hoped. We can feel perhaps a little bit like the servant in the servant song. I've toiled in vain, I've exhausted myself for nothing. We might not put it in exactly those words. We might say, oh, it's a waste of time. We've tried that before and it, it, it didn't work. Or with self-reproach, I'm such a failure. If I were a better priest or a better parent or a better teacher, whatever it might be, it, perhaps things would be better. No, that's, that's not the voice of God. Remember the parable of the sower. The sower goes out to sow and three quarters of the seed is wasted. We're used to hearing that parable and applying it to ourselves and trying to wonder how we can make the soil of our hearts less stony or thorny or weedy or, or what have you. I'm not sure if that's the point. I wonder if Jesus is preparing his disciples for the apostolate. I wonder if he's preparing them for the exhausting, discouraging task of sowing seeds of faith in an environment that's apparently unreceptive and even hostile to the message. He's perhaps preparing them for a sense of failure. The experience of standing before a classroom of children, almost all of whom will have lapsed by the time they leave. Or the experience of feeling like a nutter in the school, in the work canteen, or in the university lecture when we mention that we believe in Jesus. The scandal of seeing the numbers in her parish dwindling. Sad and painful experience of having the word that has transformed my life and which gives it meaning falling on deaf ears, ears that listen but don't hear, eyes that see and yet don't understand. I was recently rereading Evangelii Gaudium, The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis's first document as Pope, and it's a beautiful and positive and, and uplifting document. So if you're feeling a bit discouraged, that would make excellent Lenten reading. To our topic, Pope Francis says this, we can know quite well that our lives will be fruitful without claiming to know how, or where or when. We may be sure that no single act of love for God will be lost, no generous effort is meaningless, no painful endurance is wasted. All of these circle our world like a vital force. Sometimes it seems that our work is fruitless, but mission is not like a business transaction or investment or even a humanitarian activity. It's not a show where we count how many people come as the result of our publicity. It's something much deeper which escapes all measurement. It may be that the Lord uses our sacrifices to shower blessings in another part of the world which we will never visit. The Holy Spirit works as he wills, when he wills, and where he wills. We entrust ourselves without pretending to see striking results. We know only that our commitment is necessary. Let us learn then to rest in the tenderness of the arms of the Father amid our creative and generous commitment. Let us keep marching forward. Let us give him everything, allowing him to make our efforts bear fruit in his good time. Very up uplifting and encouraging words. I don't think Jesus felt discouraged. I don't think he ever felt that his exhausting efforts for the world's salvation had been a waste of time or doubted that the Father would bring his efforts to fruition. But in the eyes of the world, we have to admit that Jesus' earthly mission did look a lot like a failure on Good Friday. Of the great crowds that had welcomed him into Jerusalem, many thousands of people that he'd fed and taught on the hillsides, by the end, but by the time he was dying on the cross, there was only one disciple there, together with his mother and some other relatives. But it's in this apparent failure that the world is saved. As Jesus told the disciples uh, and the Greek speaking pilgrims, just as they were entering Holy Week, just as they were beginning uh, to, to enter the season that, that we're reflecting on, he tells them that parable of the grain of wheat, the grain of wheat which falls into the ground and dies precisely in order to bear fruit. 
And immediately before he says those words, look at what he says. The time has now come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Glorified how? By falling into the ground and dying, by being laid in the tomb and left for dead. Why? Because when God, the God who dies on the cross against a darkened sky, the God who enters deeply into the mystery of human pain and human death, the God who descends into the tomb, will be raised again by the Father in unimaginable and dazzling glory. He'll ascend to the Father's throne, as we say, to live and reign forever and ever. Mission accomplished, job done. This wasn't Jesus' death. It wasn't a tragic accident or a failure that ended up turning out happily ever after. Jesus had told his disciples repeatedly that this was how it had to be. The way to glory was the way of the cross. How many times did Jesus mention it? This is the way in which God will be glorified. This is how I'll glorify my father and save the world, bringing that salvation to the very ends of the earth, to those remotest islands, islands like Scotland. This is how it has to be. Jesus suffered and bled and wept in agony, but he never doubted that his father loved him. All the while, my cause was with the Lord, my reward with my God. I was honoured in the eyes of, 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 of the Lord. My God was my strength. After the resurrection, Jesus, the servant, ascends to the right hand of the Father to reign with him in majesty. That's how he'll come again. That's what we profess in the creed every week. To come, this time not as a servant, but as the Lord of history and the judge of all the nations, yet still bearing the glorious wounds of his passion, the price that he paid to save us. That's the end of our Lenten journey. That's where we're headed. That's what ought to keep us going, not only through Lent, but through this human life with all its struggles and challenges and discouragements. That's what St. Paul, that great preacher of Christ, the one whose mouth, like that of Jesus, was a sharpened sword, who, who, who faced so many hardships and so many sufferings for the gospel, and whose life, like Christ's, also ended in apparent failure. And yet he could write to his young protege, Timothy, at the end of his life, for I am already on the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Lent sometimes seems like a marathon but keep running. Lent sometimes feels like a struggle, that struggle with temptation, but keep fighting. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the servant of the Father who made of his life a sacrifice in order to bring us light and bring us salvation, and who will call us one day to share in his risen glory and the Easter feast that will never end. Amen. Thank you, Father Jamie. That was awesome. I love the references to the priesthood. Of course, when I was reading this, the second song, there's so many things that make you think of the priesthood. And, and so, but I didn't bring them in because I was like, that's my this part. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. That's great. We have one question about your, uh, the reading from Ga uh, uh, Evangelii Gaudium. Do you have the reference of what paragraph that's in, in the document? Oh, goodness, I off the top of your head? actually, no, off the top of my head. I'm sorry. No, I could probably find it quite quickly, but uh, okay. yeah. No problem. <laughs> Maybe next week we can, uh, yeah, we'll bring certainly. it in. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. So um, I'll start with the, the first one, but you touched on this, but I just wanted to get a little bit more specific. Um, uh, Martin asks, the servant was Jesus in last week's talk, Israel slash us in this talk. So I actually had to double check that because in the, um, in the text, in the lectionary, the, the lectionary reading, it says Israel in parentheses. I don't know if you noticed that. I'll share my screen again so that you can see it. Um, let's see, where is it? This one. Um, and so this is verse three. It says, you are my servant. And then in parentheses, it says, Israel, in whom I shall be glorified. So I double checked it in the Hebrew because I thought that's an odd thing for them to do. Um, and, and it is in Hebrew. It says, you are my servant, Israel. So there's a specification there that he's speaking to the, to the people of Israel. And then I double checked the Greek to make sure that it was there too. And it is. So, uh, so Israel is standing in what we call 
apposition to the phrase, my servant, and it's not, you are my servant uh, of Israel. So it's, you are my servant who are Israel. Okay. So just to, just to clarify that. So what's going on there? So one of the ways that these songs have been read, especially in the Jewish tradition, is that, that Israel as a nation is, is uh, the, you could say, is the instrument by which God touches all peoples. Okay. So that is, the, that is one way of reading these songs. And it's a way that it, it traditionally belongs uh, to the Jewish reading of it. Um, now, it's not, of course, it's not wrong. It's a totally legitimate way to read it. But when we read it in light of the passion and death of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, the life of Jesus, it becomes very clear that, that the person being spoken to, and it is in the masculine singular, the person being spoken to can be identified as Jesus. And the apostles in the New Testament, the writers of the New Testament, so the, the, the you could say the preaching of the apostles and then the writings of, of especially Paul, identify the person that Isaiah is talking about with Jesus very explicitly. And I think you, you touched on that last week as well. So just to say that that is, so that both interpretations are possible, but obviously we're following the, the way that the apostles read this and the way that the apostles passed this on to the church. So, um, so do, did you want to add anything to that, Father? Yeah, I, yeah no, I, I think, that, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that there is a sense in which Jesus sort of embodies Israel as well. That mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, that, mm -hmm. like, that he, like as king, as king of Israel, he, he kind of, uh, yeah, just as he takes the, the sins of the people on himself as well, he kind of sums up Israel's mission yeah, yeah. in himself as well. I find that very helpful, you know, sometimes when praying the Psalms as well, it's a slightly different uh, way of doing it, but psalms you know the divine office that, that priests and religious and, and lots of lay people pray every day is the prayer of the church that's the prayer of the, of the whole body of christ and so sometimes the psalms are feeling very sort of joyful and everything's wonderful when i'm not feeling joyful and wonderful but yet it's the prayer of the church so there's somewhere in the church where that that is that experience and vice versa you know so i wonder if something similar is going on there with that that sense of exhaustion that jesus is somehow speaking for the church some mm -hmm. mystical way but, the, you, but that idea of uh, the all of israel being taken up in jesus is also something that saint paul talks about in the letter to the galatians so when he's making the argument about who is the descendant of abraham he says that the promise was made to abraham and to his seed in the singular and he says the seed is christ mm -hmm. you no know, so that means that because all of us are in christ all of us are also inheritors of the promise, right? And so the seed is singular, but all of us belong to Jesus. So that idea of, of the singular uh, being, uh, you could say the multitude being present in the singular is also part of how Paul understands this, yeah. Okay, um, we've got another question uh, from Robert. It says, this is a quote from Isaiah chapter six, verse eight. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Is Isaiah chosen by God or does Isaiah volunteer of his own free will to be sent? I think we could ask that question for every single person. So what do you think, Father? Yeah, I think both. But I mean, God, I, I suppose, depends on Isaiah's cooperation. That Isaiah, you, you know, yeah, so it, it is Isaiah chosen by God or does does I have volunteer of his own free will to be sent the answer is yes <laughs> you know but bo bo both both I think are, are true mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and I think I would say yeah I would say both are true uh because because God God certainly is always you could say the one who gets the ball rolling yeah everything <laughs> starts with him he's never going to be passive we are always going to be the ones who receive his prompting who receive his invitation but he also, because he's given us free will, he he expects and awaits our consent and our yes. And like you said, our cooperation in the mission. One of the ways that St. Thomas talks about this is that, you know, God gives grace so that he can operate in us, so that we can cooperate with him, so that he can cooperate with us. Yeah, well, yeah. I know. There's a whole lot of back and forth going on. It's not just like, we're just like robots or puppets. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, no, no. There's a whole lot of free will that's getting mixed in there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think God also, in some ways, you know, he asks for our 
creativity as well, doesn't he? Oh, you yeah. know, I'm not sure in terms of the in terms of the writing of the Bible. I'm not sure, but you know that God God does give us a bit of leeway. You know, He gives us the mission, mm-hmm. but then it's it's kind of up to us to work out the details and well, yeah. to some extent. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, made in the image and likeness of God. The first thing that we know about God from Genesis is that he is creator. And so if we're made in his image and likeness, we are also creative. What we do is creative. Now, we don't bring things out of nothing like he does, right? But we're certainly taking things and making something new. Um, Okay, next question. Uh, Do you find that most Catholics are unfamiliar with Isaiah? And if so, how can this be remedied? What do you think, Father? You've probably had more experience preaching on Isaiah and talking with people. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, it's, it's a sort of cliche, but I think, you know, there's always this reputation so sometimes from, from our, 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 our non-Catholic fellow Christians, you know, they say, you know, Catholics don't know the Bible. I think Catholics know the Bible better than we give ourselves credit for. I think partly because we hear at so many of the readings at Mass, I was mentioning last week, you know, uh, a Catholic who goes to Mass every Sunday will hear Isaiah one Sunday out of three. Mm-hmm. So, so mm-hmm. perhaps perhaps unfamiliar with the, you know, with the historical context and, you know, that this deep uh, dive that, that, that you're helping us with, you know, in, in, in these talks. But it, I think lo- I think most Catholics, certainly masculine Catholics, will have heard a, a lot of Isaiah. And as I say, more than they, perhaps more than they realise. Mm-hmm. Uh, if so, how can this be remedied? I, I mean... I don't know, take and read it. That was the. <laughs> yeah, the it's like you know? read it. It's written, it's written so yeah. that we can. I mean, read it. look. I suppose I, I I should say as a priest, you know, perhaps we as priests could be a little better in in terms of of of, of preaching and, and and explaining these things. The problem is, we have four readings, including the psalm, and most of us like to focus on the gospel, and so with people's attention spans and you know the, the you know the children's letters coming back all, all of that stuff there, it, there is a limit to how much we can go at how much detail we can go into during the mass so i think that's why these uh, talks that's why are we're doing this for so us helpful. yeah absolutely yeah. okay uh next question so this is kind of a follow-up to the one about free will isaiah cooperated what if he refused to cooperate or is it the case that god chose isaiah knowing that he would cooperate and hence that's why he chose him yeah so Good we're question. getting now into the we're getting now into the the intricacies Actually, of what does it mean to have a free will, which is a little bit uh, beyond the scope of what we're talking about with Isaiah. But if you'd like to read that in in uh, the Catechism, you can. That's a wonderful wonderful reading about free will. Um, but uh, just to say, you know, any time that we cooperate with God, He always goes before us, and He and we are always free to say no because he leaves us with our freedom intact. Um, And does he know ahead of time what we're going to do? I say ahead of time, but the answer is um, God knows everything. And so nothing is outside of his purpose. That doesn't take away our free will because what what God's work does acts on a different, you could say a different level than our free will. And doesn't go against it. They're not on the same level so that if I push one side, the other goes. God's freedom is not in competition with our freedom. So it's not a tug of war, right? But instead, God's freedom gives life and vitality to our freedom. Do you want to add anything to that, Father? No, that's it. Yeah, that sounds good. I wonder if, you know, did God have a backup plan? I don't know. I don't think so. I agree. I agree with what he said. Yeah, he knew that. No, I don't think he, I mean, backup plan. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no okay i think those are all the questions for this evening so please join us next week we will look at the third song on the 15th next wednesday also at 7 30 p.m we had over 100 people join us this evening and of course the talks are recorded and will be posted on the archdiocesan youtube channel so you can revisit them if you'd like and we'll look forward to to seeing you next week so father would you like to to close us with prayer this evening Sure. Yeah, I'm going to use the the one of the the great things about Lent is you get an extra prayer at Mass every, every day. There's a prayer over the people. There's a kind of blessing. So I'm going to use that one, the one uh, that was used at Mass today. Great. Thank Lord you. be with you and with your spirit. Bestow upon your servants, Lord, abundance of grace and protection. Grant health of mind and body. Grant fullness of fraternal charity, and make them always devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Good night, everybody. Oh, thanks, Father.
Thanks be to God. <laughs> Good night, everybody. And we'll Good see night. you Bye-bye. next week. Bye.